Artifacts looted under colonial rule are increasingly being returned to their original owners. In 2022, Germany began repatriating the famous Benin bronzes to Nigeria. Today, this key is back. Earlier, a king from Cameroon came to Berlin requesting the return of his people's mother goddess. The indigenous Sami people in Finland are also seeking the repatriation of artefacts from Germany. Could Berlin in turn see Beethoven's Eighth Symphony or Schiller's doctoral thesis return from Poland? Things are on the move worldwide, but it's a complex issue. In the Nigerian capital, Abuja, an airplane from the German government touched down on the 18th of December 2022. Its priceless cargo, a message to the world, that Germany was following others in repatriating Benin bronzes to Nigeria, 125 years after they were seized by the British. Two government ministers attended the ceremony for the official handover. It was designed to be the first of many such deliveries. We didn't find out what this key was used for. Maybe to unlock a shrine, maybe a palace door. But what we do know is that after being robbed from Benin, it was brought to Britain but not only to Britain, and finally ended up in the city of Cologne. Today, this key is back. The treasures included a smaller version of a famous mask held by the British Museum. Its return added to the pressure on the former colonial power. The British Museum and all those holding on to our artifacts must understand the repatriation is a cause which time has come. This moment beckoned, and Germany seized it. We'll gradually repatriate the artifacts. The owners will tell us when they want which objects in which order. The historical kingdom of Benin was located in what is now southern Nigeria. The bronzes were looted by British forces in 1897 when they raided the royal palace in what is now Benin City. They included the controversial Queen Mother Idia mask that London has so far refused to return. Other bronzes were sold to buyers all over the world. Could their return now boost Benin City's reputation as a cultural centre and draw more visitors? The trip by the German delegation, with the accompanying media attention, could certainly help. Artists have been opening new studios in the city, adding to the momentum. I do believe that our visit here and the cargo we brought is historic. And the other important point is to think about what cooperation between museums should look like. How about modern art from here that is so powerful we want to bring it to us? African film, for example, coming to Germany. We need to come down from our Eurocentric throne. But not everyone is applauding Germany's decision. Some say the bronzes have actually been returned to the descendants of slave traders and that they have blood on them. It's clear that the Benin royals were not just victims but also perpetrators. The Kingdom of Benin regularly went to war against neighboring groups. They plundered, killed, and took slaves. Every king, after ascending the throne, had to basically wage a war. And so there are huge areas in the territory surrounding the kingdom where people suffered. Many of those captured were sold to transatlantic slave traders and shipped to the American East Coast. Today, many of their descendants in the U.S. are highly critical of the decision to return the bronzes. They set up a restitution study group in New York and have been following the developments closely. 
They're demanding a say in the current restitution process. The bronzes themselves are key, as they were made by melting down currency earned from the slave trade. We call this blood metal. This is a manila. This was a form of currency that the Benin Kingdom was paid in exchange for enslaved people, people that they sold into the transatlantic slave trade to Europeans. Uh, these manilas were 50 paid per woman, 57 per man. OK? So uh, the bronzes are, uh, actually contain this metal. Uh, and we consider them part of our legacy. It's part of our wealth. We should be co-owners, because this is, this is precisely the thing that our ancestors were enslaved for. The descendants of the slaves do not want the bronzes to return to Benin City. They say they should be kept where they are, in various institutions, like Philadelphia's Penn Museum. They want museums to use the bronzes to tell the victim's story of suffering. The curator of the collection is a strong proponent of involving the descendants of the slaves in the shaping of the exhibition and has reached out to the community. We wanted to make the story, the narrative about enslavement a little more complex. So this is a... a, a, a image that is very well known. It's a diagram that shows how the Africans enslaved were placed in the bows of the boats. When we asked people in the community what did they want to see here, that's what they wanted to see. What is the connection between enslavement? What is the connection between colonialism? What is the connection between African independence? The Black Lives Matter movement has served to highlight the systemic injustices suffered by people of colour and increase the desire to address the wrongs of the past. The Humboldt Forum in Berlin still has many Benin bronzes. The museum was named after German naturalist Alexander von Humboldt, a man who despised the slave trade. So shouldn't the museum make a special effort to involve the descendants of the slaves in the restitution dialogue. I think it's important that everyone who's involved in this process, who feels involved in some way or feels they should be involved, should be given a voice. And why shouldn't that be possible here? I think that's important. Which doesn't mean that we don't consider the repatriation process correct. We still do. But we're open. The Humboldt Forum is a place that is evolving. Some things will continue to change here, and why not give these people a voice? The Humboldt Forum is giving a voice to many in the debate over restitution, but not yet to the descendants of African slaves. That is about to change. But it's not just a black-white divide. We head now to the far north of Finland, where for thousands of years, the annual reindeer migration cycle shaped the lives of the Sami nomads. Today, they're one of the last indigenous peoples in Europe. But climate change is transforming the landscape on which their herds depend. Mining companies are also competing for the natural resources under the permafrost, and new railway lines are cutting off reindeer routes. The Sami are struggling to preserve their way of life, language and culture. We are fighting. We are fighting at the moment for our Sami Parliament Act. We are fighting. The magical northern lights were traditionally seen by the Sami as a dark omen sent from their ancestors. But today, they use the fascination of the aurora to promote their annual film festival, the Skab Margovat. It's held in the Finnish village of Inori. For the past 25 years, the seven Sami communities here have screened films showcasing their history. The Sami way of life was almost wiped out completely on more than one occasion. Whether it was through the takeover of their land, forced Christianization, Russian annexations, language bans, or pressure to assimilate. But since the middle of the 20th century, resistance amongst the Sami has grown. There's a determination to preserve their culture. 
langku rangku has tahi tu bihpet. Inarisami is a tiny language. There are only about 400, 400, 450 people who speak this language. So it's been a huge thing to realize that anything you do in such a small language has a huge impact. The Sida Museum in Inari showcases a collection of Sami artifacts, but many of them can only be viewed on computer screens. That's because the originals are scattered in museums all over the world. This shaman's drum is at a museum in Germany. Many drums were destroyed by the Christian priests. Archaeologists took other treasures from an island in Lake Inari that was sacred to the Sami. Sir Arthur Evans from Britain found a silver headband here. It has now returned from Oxford to Inari, but ownership has still not been transferred to the Sami. We call it the first uh, symbolic repatriation uh, that the Sida Museum had, and uh, it is uh, in the museum as a long-time loan. Many more Sami cultural artifacts can be found in Berlin's Museum of European Cultures. The museum has now started a research project with the Sami to study the cultural treasures together. Around 1,600 objects, models, photos and paintings are to be sifted through over the next few years. It's a win-win for both sides. Eva Christina Nulanda can draw on the wealth of Sami exhibits for her postdoctoral research. At the same time, she's an ambassador for a culture that few in Europe's museums know much about. I'm convinced that many museums are not fully aware of everything in their collections. And it's the same for me, especially when it comes to exhibits where the culture is so different from our own. Like Sami culture, which is so old that we're just not familiar with. I've read up on a lot of things, but that's not enough. Protective suits are a must in the museum storage. That's because many of the objects have been treated with pesticides. They wouldn't have survived all these years otherwise. Now, every single piece has to go through a detox. The researchers find a number of sacred objects in the collection. So these uh, antlers here have been sacrificed, uh, given as a gift uh, to the natures. They come from uh, the Inari area, and it was a place where you would give gifts to the thunder god. I, I don't want to touch them if it's not uh, necessary. It's very touching to think that they are here in Berlin, and it would probably be good if they could be returned. The museum agrees that the time has come. The Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation is open to the idea of restitution. We need to work with the Sami, and we are taking a first step by studying the provenance of the Sami collection. That's why Eva Christina Nulander is here, to look through everything. This is very, this is very interesting. Meanwhile, the Cedar Museum back in Inari is in the process of organising and putting on display the Finnish National Museum's Sami collection, which was returned from Helsinki two years ago. This fight to preserve their cultural heritage also highlights the role of women in Sami culture. Here, artefacts are not repatriated, for example, they're rematriated. The shape of the women's traditional horned cap underlined their strong position in society. So we claim that also Latyukahpir is a symbol for fertility. And uh, yeah, I think it's wonderful how you say that uh, the rematriation starts uh, from where repatriation does not reach. The priests uh, said that the devil lives in this uh, protrusion and the priest used to burn them. Of course, today it refers to matriarchalism also. It, it, it uh, kind of lifts up the role of indigenous woman, in this case Sami woman, as a caretaker of, of the society.
Eva Christina Newlander joined forces with artist Outi Piski to express years of research through the medium of contemporary art. The exhibition at the Cedar Museum looks at the hat as something worn with pride by previous generations of women. The exhibition is an appeal to other Sami to reclaim their heritage. But when it comes to the restitution of cultural assets, seemingly irreconcilable differences exist, even between members of the European Union. Since the end of World War II, the Polish city of Krakow has held the so-called Berlinka collection. It comprises many outstanding works of the German language, including handwritten manuscripts from Goethe, the Grimm Brothers' Dictionary, Friedrich Schiller's doctoral thesis, Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, and drawings by Alexander von Humboldt. Our position, and the position of the German government, is that they're of course the legal property of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. But the Germans did terrible things in Poland. And when you think about that history, and then start talking about restitution, you get a knot in your throat, or at least I do. Since 1989, German researchers who hold a PhD can look at the manuscripts stored at the Jagiellonian Library in Krakow. But even now, in 2023, German television still can't get permission to film here. It's politically too sensitive, we were told, off the record. The Belinka's Odyssey began in 1941, when the most valuable books and manuscripts were removed from the Prussian State Library in Berlin to protect them from the steadily worsening air raids. They were taken further east to the huge castle of Fürstenstein, or Szange, as it's known in Polish. Here, it was thought that the Belinka would be safe. So from 1941, beginning in May, they started transporting cultural treasures here from Berlin. There were supposedly 505 boxes, but some say it was 605 boxes. But at the end of the war, a few paintings of Prussian kings brought here from Breslau was all that remained of the vast treasure trove. The boxes in the hallways containing the famous manuscripts had disappeared. As late as May 1945, Polish researchers looked for various cultural assets here. They just sent everything to Krakow, to the Jagiellonian Library, so the University Library in Krakow. But after arriving in Krakow, they officially disappeared without a trace for many decades. It was a very sensitive issue in Poland. They knew exactly how valuable the collection was. But until the 1970s, no one was allowed to talk about it at all. Surprisingly, it was East German communist leader Erich Honecker who started exerting pressure on the Polish government. As a result, some books and a manuscript from Mozart were passed to East Germany. But then in the mid-1980s, Polish President General Jaruzelski put a stop to the process. So that was a turning point. There was a commission of Polish historians and legal experts that concluded the collection should belong to Poland. Hopes for a return of the Belinka did not resurface until after German reunification, when Gerhard Schröder promised Germany's support for Poland rapidly joining the EU. In return, a Bible translated by Martin Luther from 1522 was returned to Berlin. There was a project where both sides were supposed to return each other's cultural assets. But it didn't work because Germany didn't return many Polish assets. Do you have any examples? There were various paintings from Renaissance artists that were stored in Munich, some in Hamburg, so they were spread around. 
Then last year, Jaroslaw Kaczynski, the leader of Poland's governing Law and Justice Party, announced Poland would seek 1.3 trillion euros in wartime reparations from Germany. Clearly not a good time for getting the Belinka returned. It's not just about reparations, it's about settling a moral debt. We mustn't forget that an estimated 70 to 75 percent of Poland's cultural heritage was destroyed. And that was no coincidence. There was a real intention to annihilate Polish culture. The wrongs of the past continue to cloud the present. One consolation for Germany at least, some of the manuscripts are now available in digital form, including the original of Beethoven's Eighth Symphony and Friedrich Schiller's medical thesis. The sketches from Humboldt's South America expedition are also available. But what about the originals? Will they ever return to Berlin? It's not on the agenda right now. The collection will very likely remain in Poland. From a political viewpoint, there's nothing more that can be done. Even in this age of digitization, the whole debate over restitution shows that it is absolutely about the originals, the aura, the symbolic value, and the respect for the original owner. A spiritual leader from Cameroon took a 12-hour flight to Berlin last year to visit the original sculpture of his people's mythical founding goddess. The fun of the soft people went to the Berlin Humboldt Forum to see the Ngonsov figure for the very first time. It's been in Germany for 120 years. In the eyes of the Fon, the Ngonso is a spiritual being. And for the first time in 120 years, she was hearing the voice of her priest. He brought water and vegetation from his homeland to revive her. This ritual also included a royal spokesman who inhaled and then verbalized the words of the Fon. The conclusion is that he, he will not stretch his hand to touch Ngonso now, but we do, will do it when Ngonso finally arrives in Ngonso Palace, which is the rightful destination of Ngonso. Two months later, outside the National Museum of Yaoundé, the capital of Cameroon, the Fon received so artists for a traditional celebration known as the Toy Fon. The impending return of the Ngonso was the subject on everyone's minds here, and on stage too. The message to Berlin was clear, the So people are waiting. They wanted to know, when will the mother of their nation finally return to Cameroon? To hammer that message home, the Fon even broke with royal protocol and gave an impromptu interview. He said he couldn't understand why the Ngonso is still in Berlin. His Majesty says, for the length of time that Ngonso has been away, many things have happened in the land due to the absence of Ngonso because it had disrupted the spirituality of the, of the people. His palace was burnt when the Germans uh, came. They killed his father and his people. And that one of the consequences which you would like you people to know is the devastating effect of the Anglophone crisis on his land. And he believes that with the return of Gonzo, certainly some peace will come. For six years, war has been raging in the land of the So, largely forgotten by the outside world. A devastating standoff between Cameroon's English-speaking minority 
and the Francophone majority. Thousands of Seoul have had to leave their homeland, moving to neighboring regions or the capital, Yaoundé. The city is desperately overcrowded. All right. Sorry. Filmmaker Sylvie Jobati was one of those forced to flee. Her film school had to close because of the civil war. She has worked hard to have the Ngonso return to Cameroon. It was her social media campaign, Bring Back Ngonso, that got everything moving. You know, I had come to the understanding of who Ngonso was and who Ngonso is today. And I was really very angry. So they addressed letters even to the German president who was then around 2008, 2010. So I said to myself that these crimes were committed in public and they were proud of it and today they are still upholding that mentality, that mindset, the actions. So why not talk about it as well in public to also, you know, influence public opinion, to also let those who don't know understand the impact of colonialism. And I, I must say that the social media campaign really pushed for things to happen. Was it the pressure of that campaign that finally caused Berlin to rethink its position on the Ngonso? Or Sylvie Jobati's personal trips to Germany as an official restitution commissioner appointed by the FON? Either way, in the end, the official decision was taken to return the Ngonso to Cameroon. The Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation that was holding the statue relented. They explained to us why this figure is so important to them. And then it was quite clear to us that we wanted to return it and that we should return it. We've always said that for us there are two types of restitution or two reasons for returning items. Firstly, if the items were taken in a clear context of injustice, extortion or robbery, and secondly, if we notice in the dialogue that certain objects, often of a ritual nature, have key significance for the identity of the countries and societies of origin. I remember when he was handing over the decision to return. During the process of reading this letter, he, he really went very emotional. And I think that that is progress, having to understand that Irrespective of the institutions we represent, we are human beings in the end. Cameroon has now pledged to prepare a safe and appropriate home for the Ngonso by December 2023. The snake-headed museum of Fumban, in a region neighboring the So homeland, is currently under consideration. For years, Germany was unwilling to return cultural artefacts. But times have changed and a new process has been set in motion.